I was planning to give you an introduction to a core um, notion in the Kantian thought, which is the notion of transcendental. I'm going to be rather pedantic because it, is, it needs a bit of information here and there. So then we can again fly very high with Johnny next week on a much more engaging question. Um, did any of you try to read some of it again? Did you still find it completely impenetrable? For something started making sense. Start heading for me. Okay. Yeah, Rickens kind of is bad, but Kant still just goes. <laughs> in part is because the German syntax puts the subject at the beginning of the sentence and the verb at the end, and the sentence is long, so he writes in a more than baroque way, so that all these cuts into the sentence and another cut into the sentence and cut into the sentence. Um, but it's true, he wants to keep it all open at the same time. Yes. We need an immense amount of RAM to keep it active. <laughs> 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 Now, what, what um, Kant wrote, well, wrote a lot of things. He wrote three major books uh, in this space from, from 1781 to 1791. Um, the first was the critique uh, of pure reason, then comes the critique of um, practicalism, and then the critique of judgment. They, <coughs> they generally refer to how do we know the critique of pluralism? Freedom and will, how do we act the ethics and the morals in the practicalism? And then judgment, which holds a very special place because it is the hinge that keeps the two together. And actually, Kant already speaks of judgment in the pure reason um, and then expands it in this book that we are trying to read. And let's go start from the beginning of the problem that Kant's faces. Um, it was writing at the end of the life. One could make a generalization saying that it sums up the arch of uh, questioning that the life put out on the table. And they, they, um, you, you've read some um, Descartes a few weeks back. The problem that Descartes put out and that was discussed for two centuries after him, a century and a half, was that there is the subject or there is the object, or at least it was interpreted like that. And how do we know, and how do, are we, can we be certain about what we know? It was constantly debated from different angles. But the position that there is an object and there is a subject was never questioned. So very often the questioning went around the, the, the accepted paradigm that there are things in reality, there are things in our mind, how do the things that we like become inside our mind? And even more so, there were the two general positions, one more empiricist and one more rationalist. Uh, the more empirical one would always say that there is nothing in our mind that doesn't come through the senses. And the rationalist one kept saying, yes, but in order to organize this data, we need something in our mind, in our brains, that can manage it. Otherwise, what happens to this raw sensation? And there were endless variations of this problem from the two sides of the pitch, the two fields kept arguing on various uh, ways, often mixing, but they were never completely divided. Now, Kant comes in and says something that at the beginning might appear just as a compromise between the two, but actually revolutionizes entirely the way we look at things. Um, the critique of pure reason is divided into in three main sections. But the, the first um, is called aesthetic and speaks about the senses as in perceiving space and time. But you think space and time were the problem debated in the century before him. Friedrich Newton brought the Principia Mathematica in 1668. <coughs> Kant wrote this a century and, and 30 years later. So the debate was around, is space and time there as a container or a stage on which things happen? Um, 
or how do we think it? How do we think these dimensions that shape the world we are in? Now, Kant takes these and says, well, these dimensions are, are not absolute dimensions, are not things that are outside us, and they are um, supporting us, like a stage on which everything happens, or a container even that was the, the new tone of He says, these are forms through which we perceive reality. And they belong to us, not to reality. So it would appear that he is siding for the rationalist or even idealist that say that there, is, there must be something in our mind um, that structures the data. At the same time, he says these forms are absolutely empty, they're all of by themselves. They need something that, that comes from, from their own data. Otherwise, they wouldn't really work in any possible way. And, but this something that comes from the very raw data is completely blind. It makes no sense whatsoever. So what we have is always synthetic. Our image, our inhabiting of reality is always a mix of the two, a packaging of the two. If uh, packaging is in, in, in an special I rather like uh, this regard because synthesis can be understood in, in more complex ways and we've got emphasis on in different directions. But Kant speaks of taking in whatever comes and packaging it with this space and time aesthetic um, forms of, of, of perception. Then on the top of that, this is just a very quick overview, on the top of that, there are concepts of understanding, so there are forms of perception and concept of understanding, which do package again this first packaging and bring it into bring it into a more uh, organized form which give us, uh, gives us um, the sense of the world there. So that it, it is still a process of coming from outside to inside, from the world outside to us. But what can't add, what can't add is, is the, the fundamental element. There is no longer the possibility of reaching that world outside. The raw data for us makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, because we can only get in touch with it through our form of perception and to the concept of understanding. It might almost appear as a suffocating situation at this point. We are prisoners of our senses, of our, of our minds. At the same time, the whole uh, attitude towards um, engaging with the world is restructured around this, the subject, around the individual that does this packaging process. What is even more interesting is that even the inner perceptions, what one would have uh, accepted, um, would have accepted as immediate, what I would feel of myself, my emotions, my thoughts, are also always and only reachable through these forms of perception and understanding. So even I can, not only I cannot reach the idea outside me, I can never touch the table itself because the thing in itself, reality, it's beyond our reach. But we as individuals are also part of the thing in itself. We can never reach ourselves. We feel ourselves, it speaks mostly, um, it speaks of the internal feeling as something that is always packed through time, the, the duration of consciousness and then organized, possibly also spatial, but we never reach ourselves, our soul. We always have this uh, filter or mode of understanding, perceiving it and understanding it, and organize it. And it might sound just a, a acrobatic way to get out of the problem, but if you think of uh, science, for example, science no, we, we cannot see an atom, for example. We can only use very sophisticated technologies for measuring symptoms of further effects that give us the atom, let alone subatomic particles, or the light of 
galaxies, the galaxies that are far away in, in the universe. So we always have ways of uh, organizing data that could not make sense, to the point that th there is debate in science about well, you, the method you are using for analyzing this data is actually interpreting data to such an extent that maybe what you are believing to see is not really what you are believing to see. And some other school comes in with a different, different reading altogether. So he, he, the, the, this movie makes, which is called the Copernican Revolution, because it moves. Copernica was the first astronomer that um, <coughs> proposed that the universe is infinite, so it doesn't have a center, and the terms inside out, the whole notion of uh, astronomy and uh, physics, uh, the, the beginning of a completely different way of thinking. But Kant does the same for our ability to know with certainty. Does it make sense so far? Then we can go more into details. We are not certain because we touch it and obviously it's here. We are certain of a number of organizations that belong to the mode of knowing, not to the thing itself. You see the other people. Or is it Kant? Yeah. So Wittgenstein Wittgenstein is rather close to it, yes. Um, it is possible to jump between the two, although there isn't a linear, linear connection. It talks about language game and the logic of perception as well. So. Yes, however, um, Kant goes to great, to great pain to explain, especially the transcendental aesthetic of the critique of theorism, that what the, the object of experience which is not the raw data, but that thing that is already packaged through the perception of space and time, is a certain object of experience. It's not a vague thing that we know it's half an illusion. Once we have measured something through space and time, or packaged it through space and time, because there is no other way to get to it. Can you imagine something that is outside space and time? Is it possible? Not really, not at all. <laughs> we are not able to even conceive of something in space and time, let alone encounter it. But that concept of space and time is in us. Yes. yes. The idea. idea. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the fundamental change it makes. So once whatever it is, is, is in some reality out there, once I have perceived it in space and time, it is here, in this time at 625, that becomes the package, the bit of knowledge, the bit of information I am taking in. So the, the supposed reality, the real state of affairs out there is forever out there. And I am encountering it out way. And that becomes, my, I somehow see the screen, it becomes, however, and this is where, the, to me, the problem becomes very interesting for contemporary art. We keep acting and behaving and thinking as if that reality out there is there. And it's not a trick. What happens in, in Kant's logic, in Kant's way of thinking, is that although we can only encounter reality as a moment in space and time, an instance of space and time. And more importantly, we can never encounter, encounter space and time in themselves. Time, pure time, or pure space. Can you conceive pure space? Is it possible? Timeless space. Or we need some sort of law kind to it. There must be something. However, science up to then and philosophy did consider this possibility. Newton posited all of his uh, system, which was a perfectly functional system. It's not, there was no flow in it, but posited the system as something that happens on the stage of pure space and pure time. Use a, for him, it was more a container, stages comes in and out. But if you think of, uh, just to start bringing it home, you know, to, to art making. Durer um, perspective machine. 
where he makes frames and then a grid and then smaller grid inside a grid in order to reproduce reality on the flat surface of, uh, of the painting. Now that assumes that space works like that, that in reality is precisely what's kind of the same. There is a, this great invention, and perspective was an invention, was not the translation of depth onto two dimensions. This great solution, which is space time, to, to make it, to represent it for us. Now, so if, if not only we can never reach the thing itself, but these forms of perception, or then the concepts of understanding, quantity, quality, modality, relation, then can subdivide them and articulate them in endless different ways and build this immense edifice, which he calls architectonic astronomy, so last week. Um, but if these um, modes of forms of perception and concepts of understanding are always encounter, are always packaging what we encounter, and we cannot encounter them by themselves, as we cannot encounter the thing itself, they are not really existing as it in themselves. Because let's go back again to this fantastic telephone. Hopefully, I won't drop it. <laughs> this telephone is an example of a connection of space and time. But just to remain with these basic, basic things. <coughs> and then the DVD as well, and my pencil, and us here, and Birmingham tonight. <coughs> it's always space and time, pure space and time, cannot be encountered. However, we use space and time as concepts to organize our well, reality, and we don't doubt that they are there. This is what Kant calls transcendental, as something that, I'll give a definition that I'll explain why it works like that, something that is not exhausted in our reality, that is not found anywhere else either. It's sort of a loop, I see, <laughs> I'm a bit perplexed. Um, Transcendental is something that is not transcendent. Transcendent was a concept that existed in thought, in philosophy, from the beginning. There is our physical reality. Beyond our physical reality, there is the real principle of it, whether it is God, physical laws, the essence of something. Metaphysics. Metaphysics, precisely. Something that is transcendental, functions here is not is not to be found anywhere anywhere by itself here but is not beyond it it just is an open concept is never concluded universe. is an is an open universe is in, tends more to infinity as a problem. you can never is something of which you can only encounter instances but never its full definition Going back to any object we have here, and we are still thinking with this problem of, of knowing, we are not yet going into judgment. Any object, uh, we can say, well, what's the essence of this book? Or what's the essence of the person? Or what's the soul of the person? Well, you can start saying, oh, Matthias, Stalin, it's bold, it's 46, with the glasses, um, and then you can start stripping off all these descriptions, all these empirical aesthetic element and you never get a certain point that there is a naked body switched off just the flesh then you and it's at the point you no longer have the person but you never come to the plot point where you have it oh i i found this is the real essence of something imagine that you should give it strip like a person like that so like like an onion you know like uh -huh. like you go into onion you take like one pair another yeah. the third and then you end End up with nothing basically. Exactly. That was an image of Ibsen in one of his plays. That looking for the core of yeah, something, so then you remain with nothing. And on the top of that, they only make you cry, so it adds the value to it. <laughs> um, well, I, found, I found this really interesting because it is transcendental. But we are all, what's humanity? Can you define humanity? No, we are all an instance of it. 
Can we come back? What is art? Actually, that's a better question. Can oh. what is what is art? You know, like we can play this about is what, this. What, one. This is what I'm getting to. You no, know, we keep encountering examples of what art is, and we often argue about that. But we cannot draw the circle around it. It would be extremely boring if we could draw the circle around it because all our activity would be taken off. Because we would end up having an area, maybe not entirely filled, but fillable. Then the, we would not have the freedom. So it's bounded rather than bounded. Precisely. Why? Well, the transcendental, it's unbound. Mm -hmm. it might be finite, we don't know what is unbound. Okay. So it's a very strange concept to, to start understanding. It is not, it's transcendental works only here, and yet is nowhere else, and it's not concluded here. And if, to, to stretch the bit since you brought up bound, boundaries, um, Einstein's notion of the universe is that it is finite, not infinite, but, but it is unbound at the same time. It's expanding not into something else, not into a pre-existing space as a container, but it expands itself. Art does the same thing. Art expands itself. There is no definition of art that will contain it. We can say, oh, art is out of this frame. I was speaking with somebody earlier, and she's not here, and she brought up the work of Daniel Buren, who was bringing frames out in the countryside and putting them there. But that's empty frames, so you could see through that. Uh, what about conceptual frames? Or the fact that I decide to photograph these, then you've already moved the frame into something else. And I, I decide to bring attention to these other things. And, you, and that's just one. Art is out there, the artist does. So then Duchamp brings the, the, the urinal into the museum. Manzoni presents the famous artist shit, and so forth. Um, so it, because, uh, you sound like you know, like the dude, basically, you know, this sort of like. Well, there is a the famous book called the Shambles of the Yes. It's so, like the only name in mm -hmm. art if you uh, encounter an instance of it, like a very complete, mm -hmm. complete instance, but you cannot draw a rule from all the instances you meet. You Precisely. Know, you can't draw a Precisely. Can you articulate more of this? Especially on this idea of the, because the rule is then the link to victims' time. Because, you know, you know, like if you're reading the do, you know, what he says, you know, art exists as a proper name. So, mm -hmm. you know, like if we encounter something and we give it the name, you know, the name of art, so basically we go through our judgments and we call it art or we don't call it art. Mm -hmm. But even though if you would articulate, you know, like and you would, like, you, you know, you would take, you know, like all of the artworks which you are very fond of, you know, mm -hmm. like in create a museum and look at all of them, you wouldn't, still wouldn't be able to extrapolate or through a rule, basically, mm -hmm. which defines what is art. So it sort of, it only exists in like particular instances, but it doesn't sort of yes. go into universal rule. And is everybody okay with this concept? Or better, everybody, we understand. Sorry, I didn't do the usual introduction because we would have lost our name. Tadas, yeah. Your name is? Tadas. Tadas. Is, <coughs> is it clear what, what you just said? No. Yeah. Okay, point. Sort of. what, what is sort of? What did you get and what you didn't get? It's a thing to understand that something that um, you can give a name to and you can understand what it is but at the same time you can't necessarily always define it. Uh, not entirely. Would someone else try to explain it? We could recognise it and judge it but we wouldn't be able to set a criteria for the future. Mm -hmm. But the future becomes a better just point. If you think maybe about like um, dogs and different breeds of dogs mm -hmm. and like the pedigrees and stuff, there are things that you could say like Dalmatians are because they're, they've got spots, they're this size, they're whatever, and you can set a rule for the breeding of that kind of dog or that kind of dog. And I think what Tadis was then talking about is, although you can see different types of us in this, those different instances, there isn't a way in which you can say categorically because it's got that, 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 and that aspect, and that, that's what mm -hmm. makes it art, and there's only those rules. 
so you couldn't do a dog breeding program. <laughs> on to, to, our breeding on, program. On, 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 on our yeah. breeding program. Because because we have the closest thing to an our breeding that? program. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, they wouldn't necessarily even be able to define different rules as to what it is, which is why we all still have the same discussion. Um, which then comes to what you were talking about, about the, almost that, the universe. So in some ways, it's about almost what we've managed to be able to map yeah. or perceive. So even with our science, if we say that, you know, 50 billion light years is as far as, far as we've <coughs> mapped, that gives it affinity, but it doesn't say that it has, that's where it stops, that's only as far as we know right. where it is. Yeah. And it doesn't say that it doesn't then grow out of that. However, and this is still just a very simple attempt to define something, and it's all still quite static. There is the object, I try to understand it, first through the perception, space and time, and the concept of understanding, and then step up in concept is, is reason, which has ideas that regulate the behavior, and they are themselves transcendental. But, and they have uh, necessity, freedom, goal, the real four things. If you think uh, Voltaire before 30 odd years before Kant was arrested and jailed for not complying too closely with the, the with religion. Kant, who probably was religious person, already posits God as something transcendental in itself, something that we behave as if it were there, something that is the projection to infinity of all our moral values. You know, we have to assume that and God is there, the essence of the universe is there, the reason of the universe is there, but we cannot get in touch with it. So it's a major turning upside down, oh, several times if you like, when I say major, but it just puts it in a spin and then the thing never stops again. And what, what becomes very interesting when we move to judgment, we can sort of recover the previous test, but just to give you, try to give you a full picture first, is that judgment is, that, is a very strange activity because judgment already operates in the critique of pure reason, trying to place these packages that are constantly repackaged in the right box above, you know, from where do I place these in, intersectional space and time? Under, the relation and becomes something under the quantity of categories, the categories of understanding. But which category to choose, or where, where does it fit better in order to organize? No, to Knowledge them. is done through judgment. So the judgment is this engine between. What it starts then developing the critique of judgment is that another thing that we cannot reason without, we cannot engage with the world without, but things have a purpose. They're not arbitrary, they haven't happened by chance. They have a reason to be as they are, when they are, where they are. Do, do we understand this difference between arbitrariness and having a reason? Okay, so if a number of reasons, a number of things have an evident purpose, and they're not very interesting to come at this point. But there is a kind of judgment that judges upon the purpose of things, and it's not that the chair is here to make us more comfortable for staying here for two hours or the clock for keeping track of time. There is there is a kind of judgment that judges the very the pure fact that things have a purpose. It doesn't care about which purpose, and that's the aesthetic judgment. If we go back to what was we just said before about art not being definable, being a fluid area that keeps expanding, the aesthetic judgment is that kind of judgment that says, oh, look, this thing makes sense, but this sense is constantly reworkable, open for interpretation. This thing is not, this is for writing, and the only writing, okay, it's closed somehow. There are other things around here, like that one, for example, that do make sense because there is a number of things that composes them that come out, comes together in one way or another in order to create a meaning. That thing is, we, it's not fixed. 
actually that meaning is something that we build while we make it and when, when we engage with it as as a viewer. Yes. Guys, just that. So that's the sort of like the moment where the mind goes into free, free play, isn't it? Like, yes. like um, so and basically you, you don't cognize things and you don't sort of put them in categories too much. But you, you enjoy the fact work, that they enjoy stay and together. you, yeah, it makes sense. Yes. But at making sense, you learn something as well. Uh, not directly. I mean, one can, depends on how deep one wants to go in science. But it's not about learning. What he's saying there is that in, in order, um, or better, the most important for for things to to be grasped, uh, to be given, givenness would be the technical term, for things to be given, for things to come into our world of sense, and not because something arbitrary would not stay together. Something that has no reason for for being together and existing would disaggregate. That's the problem they were facing. Um, and he says, no, things they, they must have some reason for staying together. However, this some reason, as the other um, uh, examples we were seeing of space and time or something else, um, is always found in its individual empirical instances, but the overall necessity for the universe to exist, for us to be here, for uh, history to move in one way or another is never touched. So again, there is no longer this absolute metaphysical reference point outside our world. However, we keep behaving as if a reference point were there. And recognizing this cohesiveness is what for Kant gives us pleasure in the aesthetic judgment. We are just judging, oh, this has a way of staying together. It's not arbitrary to the point that it could disgregate and float about in, in space. And it has a dependency on our perception and our concept. Yes, but is it, is it, it depends on the, on the perception in an abstract way. We are yeah. just enjoying the fact that the yes. thing has reason for being together. It doesn't matter which reasons. Then we can interpret it and go down to the old criticism okay. uh, avenue of uh, arguing why and what and when and who. But the pleasure is the fact that is encountering something pulls together. And it's very interesting because Kant keeps, um, it Kant's divides it, the judgment as in aesthetic judgment and teleological judgment. Teleological judgment is the one that economically calculates the material uh, purposes of things. You know, it's very <coughs> down to earth. And it doesn't find it particularly interesting. Or, I mean, it, it, do, it does describe it, but they most, or, but for us, not just because we are in our school, but that the interpretation and the heritage of Kant concentrates much more on the aesthetic judgment because it is this very interesting thing to judges without content. So, so from Kant, mm -hmm. so that would be probably the beautiful as opposed to the agreeable and the good. Yes, the agreeable is, though, it is nice being here because it's warm outside, it's raining. We like it because there is an immediate reason for it. But we attach some value to it. Yeah, but it is a value, but it is a de determinate value. The interest, I think, that's what he says. Yeah, there, there are, it, it speaks, the, the agreeable is a judge, a study judgment with interest, mm -hmm. and uh, there are the three moments of it, this yeah. interest, no concept, and for you. Um, that agreeable is, yeah, with interest, beautiful is without interest, and good and is... And then it's called as a concept. Good is the one yeah, with, uh, with, the uh, with, with concept. Yes. yes. So the, 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 the problem, let's separate them, because otherwise it becomes too, too uh, muddled. Um, we can judge something agreeable, pleasant, fresh water when we are thirsty. Now, the, the examples he gives are very you know, sweet fruit, because we like the sweetness, we need to eat something. But that's a very economic thing. So in, for, in, in order to get there, I need to do these. And to get, you know, it could be through space, or to, 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 to get to that result. I need these steps, and therefore, if I can obtain those steps, it's positive, it's good, I judge it. Good, that's one way of doing it. But you need a concept, you need a definition that has defined all your actions beforehand. What we were just mentioning earlier, bounded area in which we move, 
if we know we want to get there, we, we, know, we, we know we want to work because we need money for rent and for going out on weekends and go on holiday, whatever else, pay for school, then we, if we get a good job for doing that, we are happy for that, but it is in function of. So, so it's not enjoyable in itself. It, it, it sounds like it's a risk through. It's not it a may journey, be, but it doesn't have to be. It, it, you have to like separate. You the, the, it can't, that's not <laughs> getting to the argument that the two things can be together or separate. But it, it, what he's saying is that uh, it does not exclude that the performing of getting a proper job to get enough money could be aesthetic. You, know, you need to get to Alan Capra from performance and happening in the 60s for that kind of thing. Um, but what is interesting, what he really wants to show is that there are moments of pleasure that gives us satisfaction because that satisfaction is economical, is in function of something else. We have obtained what we wanted because we needed it. Mm -hmm. it, it is necessary to have a roof because otherwise it's too cold in winter. We are not living a fantastic tropical apple under the palm trees. Um, so if we get a flat with sensor heating and a good roof, we are happy. But that's not an aesthetic judgment of the kind of the pure kind. Because there was a concept attached to it, or as <coughs> it, 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 it describes it in this, uh, in this critical judgment, an end. We need something for a specific reason. So our, the, 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 whatever happened in it has a necessity already laid out. So it's a means to an end. Precisely. Uh, so this is what it describes both the good and the agreeable on different fronts. The good is moral. Now I do this because it is correct to be able to do this, so, so I don't go to jail in the end, something like this, or because God will reward me. Or I, no, it's agreeable because it is better to be warm than outside in the rain or whatever else. But then in, in between these, there is this other very strange judging process that does not have a concept. So it has an object, plenty of other objects, but there is no definition that that, that object fulfills. And that's precisely what an art piece is. It's very interesting because art Kant speaks much more of beauty between, and it doesn't differentiate between nature and art in this sense. But it speaks of something where we appreciate the fact that something is there and we appreciate the, something, the fact that the purpose holds it together, but which purpose is constantly to be defined? What is the meaning of this piece, for example? We can debate it for a long time. And actually, I would say that the more we can debate it, the better the piece is. If we, you can finally get to a point where you say, well, actually, this art piece means A, B, C, D, and F. And that's, there's never anything else to say about it. That no longer speaks to us, right? it's past our cultural framework, at least. So, the function of a purpose is not important in an aesthetic. It, 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 it is something that Kant calls it a reflexive judgment because it is a judgment that plays between imagination and understanding. These are the technical terms he uses. Imagination is the faculty that organizes uh, the, the data that come through the senses, space, and time. And understanding is the faculty of the intellect that organizes things in concepts and makes knowledge. And, you say that again? and imagination mm -hmm. is the faculty. These are technical terms in the two, two centuries and so ago. Uh, but this is the way he puts it. But if you remember the, the, what I was saying earlier about the structure of, of the knowing process in the critical theorism. Space and time package whatever would come in from the outside world and give us this, this intu intuition, he calls it. And then this object of intuition, which is the, object, the first layer of, of experience, you don't have experience with no intuition, the object of intuition is organized again by the concept of understanding and becomes a piece of knowledge. The object of intuition by itself is, is as blind, and the concept of understanding by itself is empty. Alone, they don't make knowledge, they don't make sense. You need to package them together. 
and the faculty of intuition is imagination, and the faculty of the intellect is understanding. In, in the aesthetic judgment, instead, the judgment, instead of saying, well, these objects of intuition, these instances of place and time, needs to be placed under quantity or under quality or under relation, then become the structure. The judgment plays in between the two and says, well, is it possible to take these first lamp of matter, which is only in space and time, and place it somewhere? If the possibility is there, then there is pleasure for Kant. Because then immediately the thing can <coughs> acquire a unity, a purpose, a, a meaning. So it, this is, it, it is something that happens entirely within the subject. I, I see many faces about to ask questions, this is why I stopped. <laughs> but many faces that lost it at a certain point, and I don't know how far. <coughs> so this meaning thing, mm -hmm. <laughs> just to you know, start with something easy, in the, in the sense of um, the aesthetic judgment, the meaning is kind of an ever-evolving thing, mm -hmm. or is he talking, is that part of the aesthetic judgment, or is the, is the aesthetic judgment something that happens before this, this, we start doing this meaning thing? No, it is the appreciation of meaning per se. I think I the possibility that. of meaning. I but this is something that, that is going on entirely within us. It's yes. entirely of our own generation. Yes. It's nothing it's nothing like this roof and these walls provide us heat and therefore we're happy about it. That's not aesthetic judgment. That's no, no, that's no. the the, the uh, yeah, yeah. agreeable it's or yes. It's not like that at yes. all. Yes. It's entirely within this interrelationship yes. between our imagination and our intellect. And that is an ever growing thing that, it, yes, that it's, can it's just dynamic. one it keeps, feeds into it keeps the other. Growing. And it keeps growing and growing. And, growing and don't take it as one feed into the other as in as in it is never concluded. Because one aesthetic judgment can judge and be happy about something. The fact is that the, the relation between the two things is never concluded as in is never placed under one thing or the other, the, as right, under one concept or another in this pre existing structure. Is, is it like a suspense in order to sort of. Is a suspension. Resonance? Resonance? But let's go back to when you're working. We are. Some, some of us are working in more traditional disciplines, some of us are much more experimental and expanding into other things. And you're trying. And you're saying, what? Okay, even if I am painting on canvas uh, and I am painting the most traditional portrait, I keep going at it and I say, it doesn't really work, does it? It's boring, you don't want to see it anymore. At a certain point, you know, actually, finally, there is something there that makes it be a good painting rather than just oil and canvas. No. They both look like a person, but one is a bad illustration, boring, or flat. So and the other one, satisfaction at the same time. Yes, but that satisfaction does not come because there is a definition of what a good painting is supposed to be. That satisfaction comes because finally, the game of strokes and colors and the history of painting and uh, the character of the person and how much you are taking of that person, how much you are living out, constitutes a balance that is intriguing and you keep and it stays together. It creates a, a circulation of things that resonates, as you said. I wanted to say su surprise earlier, there's an element of surprise, would that be it's something, correct? Certainly it's something emerges that, you know... Or it, new, or income. Are we talking about something that's completely new? But, uh, that's no, never isn't it about a cohesive? It's about it's cohesiveness. I mean, it's not right. not new, and it's not against being new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, you, you make an art, no, you make art, but you come up with a piece, and it's a new piece. But it's not in this sense that Kant means it. It is after the idea that we are appreciating the fact that things are staying together without having been told how to stay together before. Mm. So it's like going to gallery, seeing something you like, and you go bring the thing, and that sort of... As well, yes. That's like but that happens. Moment. Interesting, I mean, Kant speaks of genius. I, I, I didn't uh, go <coughs> that far into the book yet as to be able to 
uh, speak to you about it. But uh, what is interesting of is to me is that uh, it, sorry, what he speaks about is more the receptive judgment. Now he speaks less about the artist in, in when he really analyzes the logic of judgment. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so it would be more the, the experience okay, so you go, like you go somewhere and you know if you know like in a gallery with like you know as artist and you go and something and you you see an artwork and without explanations you go something goes in your head and but it's not what, what I'd, I'd like to, to point out is that this is valid also I would say most importantly for the moment of making mm -hmm. so when you actually not yet taking in hello you are not yet uh, engaging with a finished work exhibited somewhere, but you are there. Not being an audience. Without, you are your own audience, at the same time, you don't even know if what you're doing no, makes any sense. Talking about encounter, you know, like of the moment when everything clicks together, you know, yes, that's yes, you know, yes. so without, you know, you, ex you know, sort of expectation that you know, it yeah. should yeah, come obviously together. You have an intention thing. there because you are sitting in your studio or standing in your studio, whatever you are, making things. But your intention can only get you so far at a certain point. And this is not releasing the control. It's not that you know, there is some mystical thing happening. It's not that. What Kant is saying, and I think is extremely interesting if one really gets to, to, to feel the, the, how it works, is that the, the making at a certain point shows the purpose. It comes together in that moment. And that no, it, as an artist, you judge that that's the moment. Yeah. And, and as, at, the, at the same time, you are your own viewer, if you like. And is it, like you say, the light bulb moment? Is it where suddenly, some, for no reason, the point, all the points of the all the, all the objects come together at one point? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's very important. It is a light bulb moment. As far as, uh, or as far as you do not think that you are discovering something, okay. it's not already there. Is it um, mm -hmm. Art Big Bang then? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's not more than uh, uh, Might, yes. <laughs> a lot of small Big Bangs. It's all Big Bangs. Bang. Uh, <laughs> small Bangs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there are small Bangs. <laughs> Isn't it almost like there's an intrinsic recognition of, of pattern? And I don't mean that, but when you talk about that, Cohesiveness. I'm just thinking, like, um, if you were thinking of like particular and sort of physics and that resonance, there's a, there gets to a point where it it becomes and holds. So mm -hmm. it, it it isn't like a hard, you know, moment. It just it just. <laughs> what sort of moment was that? <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but, it, but it just it just is. So it can be lots of different things that come together. But you. As a maker, and when you talk about that that in, intuition and that understanding, there's an internal recognition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you, yeah. which is that where where it it hold, where it where it makes sense is the wrong word, but where it where it holds a, a, a form that you that that you can it's appreciate, and that, that and that you you make a, 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 a definite. You use the word yeah. judgment, but you make a definite judgment and decision on that of, of, of sort of value. On yes, it, and probably a that's not be... from a point of because I've done fourteen strokes and mm -hmm. yeah. you, you don't necessarily know why. You I don't, don't think you go beyond know why... the acceptance of it, but don't. Let's get to the ideas because oh. knowing why <laughs> might actually enters into it, but enters it afterwards. Mm. Um, We're getting into the good and the agreeable then, aren't we? Is that right? <laughs> Just a sec, let me say one second. Whatever we have there while working, at a certain point, finds a way of staying together. Mm -hmm. Now, there were all the, I've got all these bits in mind on it, I've been collecting, and it, no, they are all shades of one color or different colors, or all these samples of sounds or all these ideas I had, and they are all near each other, and they potentially make a great thing. Mm -hmm. Nothing ever comes out of it, you give up on the little part. <laughs> and then, another time, generally when you're hungover, so you're less in control of what you're doing, go back, play around with it, and plop, the thing, oh, look at this. This, this combine like this, this has a funny resonance with the other one, 
and this concept of recalls the other one, and then it has a visual echo with a yellow of that object that's in there, and then it refers to the other piece, and actually also to the other artist that is in the museum. So it links to outside, inside, inside itself, by it's memory. It's indefinite judgment or something. It is indefinite judgment, precisely. That's what is transcendental to it. And you can't categorize it neither, because otherwise it would just fall apart, you know, probably. Exactly. Stretch it, <laughs> so what is what is so uh, unique of the aesthetic judgment is it that it is that it judges the possibility of, uh, the logical possibility of something because <coughs> something can stay together and if, and if it can find something that, that stays together that's what it wanted it wanted to it wanted so, this open thing and I said he enjoys that the possibility has become real. It doesn't really care about what possibility and what reality. If you're very eph ephemeral and very in the moment, isn't it, that judgment? Uh, for the pleasure, yes. But for the object created, no, it can become sustained. For what? For, so we're talking about that, uh, external objects now. No, I mean, uh, thinking <laughs> of the art piece. Um, um, no, this once, I don't know who the art piece of this is, but once this uh, was made, then this lasts. It, this is, it remains together. But the idea of starting to play with a body who is mixing genders, mixing human and animals, and then mixing uh, um, animals and plants, and so there are mushrooms and fingers growing on the ground, and not only one, uh, one end is missed from this side, but the other side is missing the arm and tally, but is growing wings. All those things are, if you just lay them out in a neat row and say, let's mm. combine it, it wouldn't necessarily work. It depends on how it is made. And it goes down to infinitesimal. Uh, you can never measure it entirely yeah. because it, it goes into the sensual. Can than I the, ask the, a the question? It's probably not the time to ask two questions because you know, like now we're talking about artwork which we like, you know. So that's mm -hmm. an aesthetic judgment, you know, which makes sense to us. You know? mm -hmm. So is that an you know aesthetic judgment if you to go and see an artwork which doesn't work for us, uh, which doesn't give pleasure? It's uh, it's. Um, uh, no and yes, <laughs> because Kant <laughs> puts it in a different way. Puts it in a different no, way. It, it, the aesthetic judgment is subjective insofar as it takes place in the subject. Mm -hmm. It's not subjective as it, insofar as it is an opinion. Um, Kant is not concerned. He, he does say that the aesthetic judgment is universal, that everybody shares it once you have. Yeah. But because it's not. The content is the fact that the thing stays together. So the fact that <laughs> so we can argue about it. I mean, obviously, uh, it, it, nobody has ever solved the problem entirely. So you could say yes, but there are things in art that some people say this stays together as an art piece, and other piece, other things that are, I think, are just odd objects that have been placed there. I was thank you. Is that an aesthetic judgment? Well, is a judgment that the aesthetic judgment has not happened? Is the displeasure, no, the, the dissatisfaction mm -hmm. thing does not come to that. I would, uh, was thinking while reading this yesterday to speak. For but you know, we still judge, you know. So, so yeah, but it's don't. The, yes, <laughs> you know. But is <laughs> don't, we don't about different don't, categories. Yes, it's a, it, the, the judgment mm -hmm. is a for Kant judging is combining mm -hmm. the intuitions and the concepts and the ideas, so uh, not simply saying yes or no. I like it. I don't like. It. So well, it's from the point of view of the maker rather than the audience? Well, both, because he also speaks of beauty in nature, so it's not the maker of the audience. But what is he's interested in is the, the whole game, of the, the whole specialty of this aesthetic judgment derives from how he has built the process of knowledge that I introduced earlier. Mm -hmm. Knowledge, just to uh, go over it again, we are not knowing reality. We are getting some abstract, unreachable input from outside. We package it with the intuition of um, the, 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 the senses, space and time. And these are the only thing that we know intuitively, immediately. They are sort of self-evident. Nothing can be out of those space and time. And then we give this package intuition to intellect, which can actually know nothing intuitively because its own concepts, causality, necessity, 
pure modality are nowhere to be found. They can only be used as... So they're not empirical. Basically. They are not empirical. Yes, they're not empirical, but empirical becomes very delicate as a term for God. So let's leave it out. Uh, they, they, don't, they are transcendental, if you want to use a technical term, because they are found no, to be found nowhere but in their application. Space and time are transcendental as much as causality is transcendental. Can you point at causality in itself? No, it's just no because you can only use a metaphysical concept that would be God that does organize everything. If you, if you take that away, you can only have a lot of examples of situations where there, there's been a cause and an effect. But pure causality, the ultimate reason for things to be developing, cannot be found. So we so use an idea it. which has very practical instances, as you say. Only practical instances, yeah. and doesn't exist per se, in itself. Like art. Like art. <laughs> and that's why it becomes so interesting. Then, then he moves this uh, structure, and he says, in art, we get the object, the package of space-time, or whatever else you want to have, it. it's the physical part. But the concept is not there. There is no, no, it doesn't enter into uh, any of the concept of understanding. We have to build that concept. And the very possibility that is possible, the very fact that it's possible to build that concept is the pleasure in aesthetic judgment. When judgment recognizes that it's possible to build that, that from what I have taken in materially, essentially, and everything else, there is a possibility of a combination and a relation, then I have an art piece and I have the pleasure of an art piece and aesthetic judgment takes place. I realize that don't take the aesthetic judgment as um, directly a creative process. Aesthetic judgment is not the maker of, uh, unless you're a really conceptual artist, it's not the maker of, <laughs> um, of the art. The art, no, it's mm -hmm. the subject makes the art. The judgment judges and the point says, yes, this can come in. This is the good piece. Yes. When, when the when the aesthetic judgment uh, judges uh, potential for, for purpose. Mm -hmm. Does Kant think it's recognizing a purpose, or, or is it saying now the time of the purpose is it creating? Yes, uh, certainly it's not recognizing a purpose There's because no purpose for aesthetic there. there is no purpose. Right. He's enjoying the fact that because the thing holds together is cohesive one way or another, yeah. it's not arbitrary. It, it's, it's building its own purpose. Right, so, so it then calls that purpose. Yes. So he, the, the aesthetic judgment appreciates purposiveness per se in itself. But these yeah. uh, purpose or meaning, somebody used the word meaning, which it makes sense. It's not it's just a reduction of the problem. Sense or meaning. These make sense as a meaning, which was not there to be fulfilled before this piece was made. Probably there were a lot of other attempts that were fine tuning to arrive to these. And then um, the beauty of, of you know, also the glass bell over it and something else. And finally, the whole thing stays together as uh, it gives us feelings, ideas, things to think of, comments. Um, before we judge that something is taking place in it and, and, and it's simply it can make sense. So it's not actually recognizing purpose, it's not conferring potential purpose on, on that situation. See, I, see yeah. even like certainly it is not recognizing because recognizing implies there's something in there yes, and you recognize, and yeah. it's certainly something is not there. No. But in how far it is conferring, as in the subject gives to the yes. object, is very delicate. Okay. Yeah. Have you got another? Yeah, it, is, it, is the, it is the quintessential transcendental moment aesthetic judgment. And indeed Kant does say that the aesthetic judgment, not the theological judgment, is part of pure reason. Is actually the working of a transcendental reason at its most uh, its best, at its most after and intense, because it judges the possibility of sense without the need of something makes sense. Or better, it, it, it generates it while it makes it. There's no preconception as it would, you know, with expect aesthetic judgment, you know, there's no pre preconceptions, you know, expectations. But there is no concept, indeed. So it would then would become a preconcept in lay language. Yes, that's precisely.
is this sort of starting to become just a bit clearer? So it's a sort of concept-free moment. It is a concept-free moment, yes. It sounds like you just, you sort of, hang on, what am I trying to say? You, you're just kind of acknowledging something there, almost, without, mm -hmm. or potentially, without, yeah, well, I mean, something is there because without... There's definitely something there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's not just your that made more sense in my head. Mm -hmm. but it's no, one at a time, sorry. As opposed to nothing, I guess. It's, but it's, a, it's, a it's your relationship, it's the relationship of you with it. You're not just recognising something in it, but um, of it. It's the relationship you have with it. Yes. Um, yes, because for Kant, everything is a relation with it. There is no it per se, and there is by itself or you, mm -hmm. uh, separated from it. So much that what has been criticized of his more recently by a new current called speculative realism is that he opened the old field of philosophy that they call correlationalism. And things only exist in relation, everything is an interpretation, and they want to go back to our facts, and they are desperate to get so. This is a book, and a book is a book, and you can't discuss this, and that's an. <laughs> uh, they go back to the cart and I don't know. Um, but. So yes, there is a relation involved. But what Simon was just saying, that you realize there is something there, is actually very much the core of the problem. Because without purpose, you can't, nothing can be there. They would not stay together. Now, the book has a purpose that is quite defined, and it stays together because we need to recount only one object rather than on pages flying about the city or whatever else. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. But um, that kind of object, or any other art piece around here, or a beautiful flower for this matter, because it does speak of that kind of natural beauty as well, does not have a concept that holds it together, does not have an, an existing purpose. But it's like an inferred concept. I mean, you, know, you were talking about the book, you know, which was created and you know, with a designated purpose. No, it's not inferred. What do you no, mean by inferred in this case? I was just going to go with the flower thing, mm -hmm. right? So if when he talks about that sort of teleological, like, evidential purpose, mm -hmm. he talks about a flower, it has a functional purpose in providing you know, it's mm -hmm. about part of the process of mm -hmm. that plant's development and attracting insects to do mm -hmm. that and to continue. So it has a purpose in that sense. But it, but it but we make it have a purpose in terms of the aesthetic judgment we make about that mm -hmm. flower because we're not thinking about its functional purpose yes. when we're making an aesthetic judgment about whether that flower is something that we consider it holds together because of that combination of colours of the sunlight and the Mm -hmm. everything else yes. about it. Yes. So it ends up still having a, a meaning, if you want to yes. use a different word, but not but not relate to its function. Yes. yes. It's, it's, quite, it's quite correct. Let's let's take these and look at it from a different <laughs> a different angle. In English we say something makes sense. And which means it's, it's meaningful. In other languages, like in Italian, just this is why I noticed the difference, things have sense. Mm -hmm. Don't make sense then makes me think that making sense is a dynamic active process. That is not a static, that is a thing that does not own a meaning detached from it. But its way of being and its way of being structured generates its meaning. It's just a trick to get to, to, the, to, to this point. But making sense is dynamic. And if if we like, I mean, we can read some or just try to bridge it to Wittgenstein, depending on how you how much of brain is fine. Let's do it. Okay. Did you try to read Wittgenstein at all? Was it as obscure as Kant is? Different way. It's very disorganized. Yes, because it could be just he wrote in his notes. He never published uh, these yeah. things. And, uh, um, let's stay with this idea that there is, or there isn't, 
the reality outside. This problem. Wittgenstein works on uh, making sense from the point of view of language. And this book, Uncertainty, is actually dealing with judging now, judge things, and how we get to making sense or not. And you remember last time Johnny was describing the problem of Moore that was saying, well, enough of all these vague talks up in the clouds. If I've got one hand and here is another hand, I can start saying that reality exists, I can clap them together, I can hit you with a fist. Certainly, you feel my hand is there, and it's self-evident, and not argue about it. Now, these, for, for Wittgenstein, would be a key, I'm not saying the same thing, but a key to curse through all these um, descriptions that Kant made of uh, intuitive form of perception, space and time, concept of understanding, ideas of reason, and pretend to reach straight again to the reality that, that in itself found there. Why? Because he said, well, the, this hand by itself makes no sense. I need to link it to language for it to have a meaning. Mm. Otherwise, what do I do with it? It's a static entity that doesn't take me very far. And what, this is, this is the last book that Wittgenstein wrote, so there is a lot of his previous work in it, but what he's aiming at is to say that instead of thinking and therefore acting as if language would have a direct line that links it to reality, word by word, or sentence by sentence, which, which is what originally he thought in the famous book that Daniel rejected the Tractat of Logical Philosophy, where he said, <coughs> no, it's not a, a, language gives us a picture of the world, and as such we use it. Then he starts thinking, wait a second, language gives us a picture of the world, but cannot give us a picture of how it, how it is giving us a picture, cannot explain how it is doing it, because the only thing it can offer us is more words. So, and it, this is why Victor Stein writes in this funny way where he asks a question and then he sort of asks, but what would be the explanation of this question? Well, the thing is that, and then what else can I tell you to explain it more? And you give more words and more descriptions, more verbal definitions. So you always remain on this linguistic level. And it does say, yes, if I, if I point, I say telephone, I might create a, a rigorous link between the word and the object. But we don't go very far by pointing, huh? do we? I mean, uh, it'd be a very, very cumbersome way of communicating. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are some, if nobody knows what these, this kind of phone is, because we, it's, the, the, you know, we're still used to the old uh, rotary phone. You say telephone, they look here, you're mad. This looks like a chocolate tablet. I mean, it's not, so even pointing, uh, no, technically it is called ostension, is not really getting us very far. While, and, 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 and the, mm, any explanation you might try to give to explain that that's a form and this is a class and so forth can only give more words for it. So again, it never reaches the thing itself. To the point that the thing itself, again, for Wittgenstein becomes a known problem because what he is what concerned with or what is it? What makes sense are word games. The way we organize the words and how we react to the words in the way they are organized. In another book that he started, Philosophical Grammar, he's saying that the meaning of language is its set of rules, its grammar, because you only react to things said in a certain way with other things said in another way that connect to it, and then again with that to something else or something. It keeps going around. It's a bit like the musical chairs. As long as the music goes, you can trust that the game can continue and you can most likely sit. But there is one chair less than the people. So somehow it's transcendental, the game. You, you never have a complete reduction to, to the chairs. So many bottoms, so many chairs. No, the one is left up. It's, it's not concluded. And language equally is not concluded in this sense. What becomes even more interesting for Wittgenstein, if you if we take it from the point of view of Wittgenstein, is that language starts as a very simple set of rules, rewards plus a grammatical rules, and has so far an almost infinite or infinite um, possibility of application. 
we haven't got yet to the limit of language. We can still combine words mm -hmm. and sentences together to make more sense. Like Prince for example. Right? Oh, no, I mean if we go like technologically, you know, like you say, mm -hmm. one day, you know, like we invent something which prints, you know, like yeah. you do, this is a Prince, you know, so you know what I mean? Oh yeah, but not only that, even if like, you can have a new object and a new name for it, but just a combination of, uh, I mean, if, if you take the dictionary, no matter how big it can be, obviously there is much more text that makes sense than just that book. And this is just a fraction of what has been written, not let alone said, in the history of language. So you have a very small set of rules in report to what is the way it is used. Yes. So language in terms of the written or spoken, it doesn't Written make difference. Spoken. Okay. It doesn't make this difference. Right. But what it, 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 if this were the a grammar book of English, it would not contain all that we have said this afternoon. And it's not even not, it's not even meant to contain it because it is a set of rules that then go out and combine each other and then combine in more complex layers and in more complex complex layers, and they grow exponentially. So at a certain point, you can make a comment attached to a whole set of words, like this one, and it grows on. And then you change the ways you use them, and then again, so then they can become poetic, technological, bureaucratic. The and relation of words to another word. Yes. And is that the understanding the word, you know, like, why, 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 what it isn't, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's like if you say, if I say, you know, like a hand, it means mm -hmm. I'm not meaning a leg, an eye. Yes, but what do you do with expressions, you know, utterances of a leg? <laughs> a leg, okay, then what? Yeah, but you know, then, you just like on between times terms, like, I shouldn't really say, I know, that yes. it's not a hand, you know, like not a, you know, not the chair. So if you did, but let's then try to. Do, can you pick? Are we got to go no, it's right? a PDF only. I will need to wait a little bit now. So this is a sleeve. I've got a book here if you want to. No, I got it as well. I just want to see. Um, on, uh, for those who have the book, it's on page 10, the sentence 58. We will bring it up in a... <sighs> Is it coming up? Sentence 58, which is at the end of the first section of the book. <coughs> if I know, etc., is conceived as a grammatical proposition, so something that is following some rules, of course the, the I cannot be important because the, the rules of the proposition should hold by itself whatever the subject is. And it properly means there is no such a thing as doubt in this case. I know. Knowledge is not doubt. Or the expression, I do not know, makes no sense in this case. And of course, it follows from this that I know makes no sense either. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's another one. <laughs> 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 <Two hours. laughs> I know, the, just the, the sentence below, is here a logical insight. Only realism can't be proved by means of it. So, I know it, it <laughs> yeah, makes no sense whatsoever. Well. Well. <laughs> yeah. Now, realism, realism is as in reality, you know, an attitude yeah. that believes that reality is there in a meaningful way for us cannot be reached by uh, claiming I know. Because if you start trying to demonstrate what you know, well, I know this and that and that. Why? Well, because this and that, you only deal with more words. Quite endless combinations. Yes, and it's very important because they, they, they to understand that these, this, this thing that he calls a word game 
that is what Johnny calls a surface very often. It, it moves horizontally within itself rather than having a vertical route into reality. So all pro problems of identity, definition, the for politics, the for the definition of art, become unsettled and float about, but not float about as in the postmodern simulacrum that would like to have a root and doesn't have it and the is negative. They find a connection through themselves rather than rooted vertical as proper names. Proper name is my no, Mattia is a proper name. It is also a logical a grammatical concept as the, the, the name that defines one and only thing. And the problem of the proper name is what Wittgenstein finds cannot be relied upon as the root of the sense of language. The root of the sense of language is its circulation. Um, as a parenthesis, if you want to have a good... There is a fantastic film by Derek Jarman, a British film director, titled Wittgenstein, on the life of Wittgenstein. Um, Wittgenstein. <laughs> it's just for the people. <laughs> um, where, uh, it's on YouTube. It's divided in sections. Um, it is highly entertaining, uh, very clear on his thought, and it's very interesting because he shifts the question of uh, proper name a step further. Um, they, there is a whole, uh, not that subtext, it's quite evident about uh, homosexuality and the you know, proper name. You, Falling in between, this one was gay, um, falling in between two existing proper names, male or female, it doesn't fit, So, or, or, but then it works so horizontally rather than having to find a, a slot, a concept as Kant would have put it, to fit into. Uh, so watch it because it's, 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 it's fun, but it's also a very interesting, it's very clear. Next to it, as soon as you look for it, you find some early 80s. Um, interview between John Searle, who's a philosopher of language, and an interviewer, four sections, where John Searle explained this in very, very clear terms. One could uh, argue that it doesn't put everything that there is there, or doesn't put some very difficult aspect of it, um, but it's a very, very clear introduction if you want to hear another voice beside mine uh, on, uh, on his own. Both of them. And it's fantastic because it's being 1980 or whatever, it's an old analog tape that they're doing, and the look of the philosopher, the interviewer, and so come up. It's quite so, so. <laughs> um, but in, in, a, in the language, going, going, going back to, to, to the more simple problem, is transcendental as well. If we think of transcendental as something that we only encounter empirically, as the word circulated before, but does not have his foundation somewhere else. It does not, you know, it, it doesn't have a, an absolute reference point somewhere else but to get that guarantees all of its meaning. But you, you got already to it when we were talking about art. There is no definition of art. There are only endless episodes of it. Yeah. So I'll give you this last thing, then, then we'll, we'll... Kant speaks of ground, and Johnny will go about ground throughout the year. <laughs> now, ground is a philosophical, technical expression, it's a concept, but don't be thrown out a little bit of the... Because it's, um, it comes from German, where ground means logical foundation. It, it is this ground, it, uh, physically it is the ground, the bottom layer, the, the thing below which there is nothing, is what you stand upon. But if you, if you only remain with ground this, as in the ground here, it becomes a bit too spatial only, nothing mm -hmm. else. And then it might prevent you from understanding uh, how the, the problem is developed. For Wittgenstein, this problem of foundation, what is sense rooted upon? What, what is the fact that the language in circulating 
makes its own sense because we are used to use some expression in a certain way, therefore we know how to react to those expressions and then we repeat it and move it further. And then progressively some minor changes happen, and, but they, they, they are minor enough and they propagate slowly enough so that they become accepted. And therefore we are, they are still understood. So the, what Kant would have pulled ground and tried to locate somewhere, or the tradition of the time would to locate somewhere, is in the language, not below the language. Going back, the, 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 the meaning of art is in the making, is not representing something that pre-exists. The soul of the person is not somewhere deep inside, is this, not to use traditional expression. So is, now, the definition, the identity of the person is all the infinitesimal characters that one is displaying. And it can never be fully concluded. So it is always and only clear, it is all because it's never one thing. It is never it can never draw a boundary around it. And this is, to me this is why this speaks to art making, especially in contemporary art, where we are no longer bound by disciplines. Uh, this speaks to it directly because it does not make sense anymore if going back to the census 58 if I know or I am certain there is a link between what I say and the object outside there um, it is considered as a grammatical proposition as in a logical formula that responds to a set of rules I can change the elements I put in it but the logic would still hold together so he says, I is not important. And actually what he properly means is that there is no such a thing as doubt in this claim I'm making. I know that it is 7.30, there is no way this can be doubted. But, if, uh, but in that case, uh, the expression I do not know otherwise would make no sense, because if there is no room for doubt, I cannot say I don't know. That's always and necessarily constantly certain. And therefore, if it is necessarily constantly certain, I don't even need to claim I know because it's already there. But then nothing has room to move it because it will be locked. So he says, I know is a logical insight. It's like a projection. I always act as if it were possible to put some distance between me and reality and say, yes, I know that thing. But um, I cannot prove the existence of reality. It is an as if. It is transcendental. It is a tool for navigating things rather than an anchor that keeps us rooted and blocked to one spot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you you said on <laughs> it's too much. I think that you, you are scared by the the language that is being used here more than by the the concept of it because mm -hmm. You are experiencing it. You know, I came out. Your understanding of art is very close to it. Um, um, that's what. Well. There isn't that much. No. Once we once we have understood, <coughs> and I hope it, it is rather clear for also for for those that are maybe a bit more sensible, look more skeptical, that there is no overall definition for art. Art is a practice that has an history and a whole and that we keep adding and every time we find a way of adding that creates resonances and raises new questions and makes us make more and something that comes to see it and says yes and no but maybe then there is a knot that holds together and is dynamic because it keeps producing and we have a new piece so that funny space of art is expanded by another bit and then expands here and it's all just bubbling up in all directions and so is sense in general so it's art like language yes in that respect yes i mean i, mean, I would be very careful in expanding this claim yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like it in the sense that it's it is a surface like language. yeah that is yes yeah. Do, do you these these um metaphor almost between ground and surface do you understand now how it is used? Uh, the ground would have always been that absolute reference point that doesn't change, 
and to which you constantly reduce all you 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 are thinking, doing, or saying in order to explain, to give justification for this book, also guarantees the necessity for being things one way rather than another. Undoubtedly, ground. Yes, that would be the metaphysical understanding. Now, through Kant, this notion of the metaphysical understanding of the ground, it is at least moved inside the knowing process. And it says, oh, it's not, what's out there as absolute and, and eternal, it's outside of our reach. We act as if, because we have these concepts or, or forms of intuition that we apply each time, and there is no other way to act but by applying them, but they cannot be encountered in themselves, so they are transcendental. Space and time is the example, but we could say in more contemporary terms, can you think of something that exists outside capitalism, as in outside economies? Is there anything that is outside? One way or another, everything is taken in by, by the exchange, economical exchanges that would have been the, the problem introduced by Marxism. Then you could say, can you imagine of anything that is not taken in the flow of desire? psychology and Freud comes into it, and then you have another dimension, so already these forms of intuition can be multiplied. I like to think that the 21st century digital techno-revolutions might have, or innovations, whatever you want to call them, might have added some sort of intensity of connection as another ever-present dimension of our, of our life, without which it is impossible to, um, to grasp something. Things that do not give themselves outside this dimensions and yet you do not find connectivity in itself as you cannot grab the internet or the web in itself you are the most is a bunch of cables and servers and it is much more than just that yeah. so these things are imprescindable inevitable and yet they are not existing per se so they are transcendental because we need to use them but there is no sense there is no givenness without and ultimately for Kant is the purpose of things that wraps it all up together in from the aesthetic mind. Mm -hmm. And yes. So the, the transcendental then lives in reason in a sort of logical operation understanding. It lives it lives, so lives in reason, lives in logical operation, yes. I, I, it's that realm of idea basically. Yeah. Ideas for Kant are transcendental. So the idea of, of will or freedom for practical reason. Or they, they are, yes. But it's important to think that they are not out there as transcendental because otherwise they are transcendent, they are metaphysical. They only exist when we start combining things. So they only exist when this, the system is dynamic. They are dynamic concepts. Indeed, Kant's called them regulative. So they regulate the behavior of practice, you know, the making, the knowing, uh, the judging. We use the word virtual. Yes, it's a very <laughs> delicate one. I don't like it. Okay. okay right. <laughs> no, 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 but, but, but because it's, it's good sort of to exists, clarify. It, it exists in a way, but it doesn't. Like virtual reality. Uh, something exists, but it's not. Okay, yes, I see why you bring it up. I mean, it, it has something in common with transit. Yes, but virtual. I, uh, They're interactive. Vi they are? Interactive. Interactive is a good way of putting it, but I. It's very important. They do not. No, no. They do not exist in themselves. No, no, no. no. So virtual, I say, is problematic. But problematic is, is, is limited because it implies still a beyond. The, the virtual reality is a, a funny expression. There was a, a sociologist that said we shouldn't be speaking of Manuel Castell, a Spanish sociologist. We shouldn't be speaking of virtual reality. We should be speaking of real vir virtualities. Twitter is not to be touched, but it's unreal. Is it? In all this fantastic nonsense and presence in the communication world. It's real. We, it affects us. There are scandals. <laughs> Fame made and unmade through so, when you say um, these things do not exist in themselves, does that go back to what you said before that understanding is empty? Uh, yes, but not directly. Like no. um, yes. 
No, don't don't draw it out again. We can we can revisit it in a moment. Um, things that existed themselves as see, obviously Kant was also a man of his time, although we are um, interpreting it a lot for present purposes. And so he was dealing with the question of certainty of knowledge. Because he was trying to find a logic that could support scientific research and give it rigor. Um, all the things. So it, there was the, the certainty of knowledge and the necessity for the world to be as it is. The, the fear was uh, once the, the, the thought is starting abandoning the idea of an absolute God that had created and before defined history and the world that should go. The problem is, well, well, if there is no God, then everything could fall apart anyway. Mm, okay. And if it doesn't, there must be some other reason why it stays together. Now, Kant, is, what he's basically saying is that, well, this thought that there must be some other reason is our ground, is our, the form we think. It does not mean that there is a reason outside that we can no longer speak about. Because we are already, there are already so many translations, so many tools between us and the so-called reality. I will never reach it. There's language, there's technology, there's glasses, and without which I could read Kant, for example. So forget about talking about it. No, it's, and <laughs> so the, the reality becomes this thing that we assume is there. We behave as if it were there, that we don't touch. We are far more interested in the way, in the modes we interact with it. So, so it's a, yes. The energy is virtual. No, it's not virtual. Don't, don't fall for it. <laughs> for us. Uh, no, uh, because virtual. Even, even, the, the, what, what is called virtual, which is related to. There are two problems there. One is the virtual related to technology, which I think are not virtual. They are real. They are just not tangible, as in no, one cannot touch them. Then there is a, a line of thought that comes from with the, the, the laws and the postmodern, which puts virtual as is a late interpretation of transcendental that progressively makes it more and more transcendent. And I, I don't go there, it's, but I go there, we can go there in, in future seminars, but it becomes uh, it's, it's difficult to, to approach now. and. Uh, it creates more problems than it solves. I, I don't agree with it personally, but that's my, my opinion. The here is not important. The point is, virtual is still retaining the idea of a beyond. There is the real and the virtual, and there is a partition. What Kant is saying, that's the, the fantastic twist, which is, is beautiful, also what is difficult to understand, is that what we are using to explain our world, our life, the sense of it, applies here, is not exhausted in, in the here, in, in our lives, in our, in our world, but is nowhere else either. So the necessity of things, the purposiveness of things which we were looking at earlier, the very fact that a real reality exists, the whole of reality exists, is something that we can no, no longer reach. We can only say, well, these books, yes, exist in these moments of space and time, and so these books. Mark and table and ass, all these. But existence in itself has become ungraspable, almost nonsensical. However, it is a, the concept of his existence is something we use for reason. Language, the all of language, we cannot contain all of language. It, no, it exists partially in each of us. And even the some of us have not contained the whole language. There is always more possibilities. It's an open structure. It's always changing. It's always changing and possibly right. also expanding. That's, that, that, that's what is, what at least it gives um, ground for. Right? The, 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 the transcendental, it is, it's, we can say now in, in the interpretation that it's not only uh, and, and, and open support for things that can also expand as art, as you see. It makes a bit more sense? Or is completely transcendental, but it's transcendent. <laughs> <laughs> just, just keep this something that transcends, is something that is beyond this book. 
And the, the best way to approach it is the traditional image of any sort of divinity that is outside, doesn't have a body, you know, it lives in, in, in eternity, and when it wants, just walks in and does what it wants to, uh, breaking all the laws of physics, and it's somewhere else. And it's the creator and the reason for things to happen, and everything has to comply with that. Kant is not arguing against it. Uh, it's not against the re religion itself. That's not uh, what is, is concerned. It is that when we think of something that is the origin and the end, the necessity of what we have, we cannot think that we know it. We, we don't, because what we, we get is only a filtered encounter. And the, the packaged encounter, which you know, is first to the concept of intuition, then to the concept of understanding, then regulated by the ideas of reason. And I insist, try to, to, to imagine something, not only that exists outside space and time, but something outside economy. Something that is, in, in every possible way, is not related to capital. Even when you take a fantastic week off and you go climbing with your tent up a mountain, you've actually paid for it. <laughs> save time, save money, both the tent and the boots, whatever. And you are, in, 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 at the most, in a negative relation to money. But you are not escaping. And if you are an outcast on some island, you so much wish you had money for a ticket to go back. Uh, there, there is no, it's a no other dimension, that is, and so is desire. Everything is now for our culture, one way or another, taken to the stream of desire. Consumerism. There are, these things are there. We cannot find something that is purely existing without definitions. This is what can be doing. And it says that these forms are defined are, are the transcendental forms. So they, they, apply to us, we use them constantly. You, last week you said, can the ground be ever achieved? Mm -hmm. uh, they, in, this, in this case, uh, they, they, they are always here, so it's not at a certain point we finally reach and achieve the knowledge of time per se. That does not exist. Time is a way we measure things with. We cannot get to things without measuring the time. So space and time is the ground on which we judge. <laughs> no, exactly. No, um, no, not the ground on which we judge. Uh, they are the form which package things, the reality for us. And we judge the combination of the first layer of packaging, the intuition of space and time, with the second layer of packaging, the, the forms of understanding the concept of understanding, which, to be more specific, first are intuitive, have a self-evident relation with the real, while the second are not. They are all intellectual. They can only relate to the abstract concept. They cannot intuit anything because there is no object of necessity. There are causes, but causality per se is not an object that can be reached. Time, per se, cannot be reached. You only find things in time. Space, per se, cannot be reached. You don't seem too convinced. No, 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 no. I'm convinced about that. I'm just thinking you know, where the ground comes in. You know, like, but the, 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 the interesting bit is that the ground, rather than being at this point, if we stay with space and time, and how it was um, conceived before time, the ground, the space and time offered a ground, a stage, for the events of reality to unfold upon. But that's the way Newton put it. Space and time were contained, pure, this fantastically smooth, plain, striped, so diagonal. We know that, no, we no, know no, that no, they no, exist and we don't doubt them. So there could be these concepts, you know, like, so we, I mean, they don't exist out of, out of, out of you know, like I said, you know, outside of our mind. But they, are concepts which have, you know, continuous instances, and mm -hmm. we are certain that you know space and time exists. You know, space no. and time is an inherent part of us that is 
making that stuff exist for us. Precisely. But we behave as if they exist. Precisely. Very good. I believe that these two last <laughs> definitions sum it up. <laughs> they are forms that are inherent to our way of grasping reality. You said it much better than I did, actually. Um, Space and time are inherent within us yes. that make everything out there exist for us. For us, but we behave as if... As if they're real. Yes. Whereas after this evening. Not say anything else. <laughs> so then our concept of space and time would be a ground for us because we can't get there's nothing we can do about that, is there? Yes. It's that's just gonna happen. That is happening. That's just there. Yes. But the fact that we, we know at this point that we behave as if they were out there and instead they yeah. are inner to us. Yeah, yeah. makes this ground a very special kind of ground, the transcendental ground. Yeah. Now, when you're running late for the train, you don't really think of, hopefully, magnetism can keep all the atoms together on the table, the way that just yeah. fly <laughs> down to the center of the earth. You don't ask yourself that question. Some, this is a very banal image, but something similar happens to it. It is happening in this concept. We, we behave as if, but the ultimate reaching of it is not that. Don't take it though as a loss is actually you know, it gives us far more freedom because going back to, to this description of art that we can be creative, we can decide. We can be inventive. Even if we know that we're behaving as if mm -hmm. does that mean we can behave in a different way? We, there is room. Well, let's see. This is. Uh, we almost have to act as if. We, we, we for can't. some for some things we have to act as if. But also, mm. let, let's not forget that Kant is making layers here. Yeah. So some things are almost pointless to uh, doubt. As you know, space and time, we live as if they were there. Are absolute. We know they are transcendental. There is. Unless you're really into <coughs> theoretical physics, for our daily matters, you know, they, it, we might as well think they are there. Uh, but when we start coming to more sophisticated concepts, uh, identities, definitions, what would keep an identity, the definition of an identity or a political order in place in one way or another, then knowing that it is an as if gives us a lot of room for, for change, yes. And, and actually, we have been now keeping them separate for the ease of conversation, but all these layers are constantly working together as a, in a dynamic interchange. Because of the, if I go back to say, this book has got a place in space and a moment in time only, I don't really do much with it. I need to be able to, to, to the reading of it, engage with it in other texts, experiences, Questions, explanations, how do I use it? Is it more past the seminar? Can, can, does it have any uh, uh, implications for my daily life? Or whatever you want to add to it. So mm -hmm. it's dynamic. The other thing that comes in with Kant is at this point, we can no longer understand the relation with reality and static is more dynamic. It is constantly in the making. Because it starts to imply much more conceptual. Don't be afraid of But almost the, there's a dynamism, and maybe that, that's one of the links maybe with um, Wittgenstein and that language thing. But uh, that part of that um, area of treatment, that sort of conceptual and the knowledge and understanding, mm -hmm. almost becomes a dynamic. It is, it's it's a, and, it, it, and it becomes and it, changeable, which then affects the how you intuitively in your perception mm -hmm. and then you and therefore those different layers of <laughs> I'm getting into such some sort of cyclical thing but it then but it then changes the real the reality. Changes the your, your, yeah, yes. 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 
Um, it is five to eight. If some want to go to talk, can obviously should go. Um, but I don't want to. We can end the seminar here, or I don't, I don't want. If someone goes away, that they miss anything. But if you have more questions, obviously you can ask. If you are completely fine, it's fine. Fine. Yeah, I think you did that. Do watch Wittgenstein by Derek Jarman. It's yeah. funny and it's clear, and the way he's starting to link senses and sexuality has to. Be.